Welcome to the September edition of the Joy Book Club. Now, this is a book that I have been looking forward to reading, but also uh, an author I have been looking forward to having a discussion with about uh, his research and lived experience in the venture capital world and the disadvantages that uh, many people in this world have, uh, women uh, and people of color uh, and of ethnic backgrounds, et cetera. So this very important topic uh, as Tech Pixies itself is a company that is a female-led company that has raised investment and has hit some challenges as well in that journey. Uh, so Eric, over to you. Uh, I just have to say, um, you know, Eric has a background, obviously a huge background in lots of different areas, but has a very strong legal background. And reading the book, it felt like you were making a case and like one of the strongest cases uh, that I think we've seen uh, in uh, in any entrepreneurial book about the benefits of um, sharing venture capital money uh, and and making it more uh, more equal. Um, why is this so important to you? And uh, and maybe introduce yourself to help people who may never have heard about you until today or before Tech Pixies. Um, give give them a bit of a flavor as to what you're all about and why it matters so much. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone can actually hear me. It is good joining you from London and thank you, Joy, for the support that you give. Um, we don't need permission and then the various elements that are associated with ImpactX, which is my day job. And ImpactX is a venture capital company. We are making investments in underrepresented entrepreneurs for a variety of reasons. The main one being that there's such inefficiency in the marketplace. When we look at underrepresented, we say, what are other people investing in and who are the people who are getting money and therefore who are the people who are not getting money? And unless we actually believe um, that women and people of color don't have the same ambitions and don't have the same aptitudes, don't have the same desire to create large scale companies, the in the small amounts and insignificant amounts of money which are invested in women and people of color in the UK and in Europe is such an inefficiency that if indeed we put money and infuse capital into those populations, we are likely to um, incubate and create and then grow some of the most interesting businesses that the world has ever seen. That is our thesis and we have been proving it since 2018. And when I think about an especially under invested portion of the population, I think about women. Women in the world make up more than 50% of the population in almost every country, particularly in Europe, uh, Western Europe and the UK. And indeed in the UK as a subset of the rest of the world, less than 3% of venture capital goes to women who are starting businesses, less than 3%. Um, and if you are a woman of color, if you're a black woman, take as a subset of women, black women, 0.02% of venture capital goes to businesses started by you. So those numbers do indicate that there's a huge gap because we as a company have seen billions of dollars worth of unmet capital desire that's not being met by the current economic system. And we know that women are building some of the biggest, some of the fastest growing businesses in the world. And we know that there are large parts of the population. So we believe investing in them makes sense. That's the day job. We Don't Need Permission came out of not only my day job, but out of my lived experiences. And quite frankly, it's made possible because of three black British women. My publisher, a woman named Andrea Hoffman, who was at Trans World, which is a Penguin Random House in, in script. Um, then there is uh, Natalie Jerome, who is at Curtis Brown. She's my agent. She's um, British Welsh, um, Black British Welsh. Then there is um, Eva Simpson, who is my strategist and who helped me to find all the other people who are involved in this project. And she is um, a, she's Black British um, and of uh, from a Ghana British background. So when I think about who are the people who have allowed me not to have to ask for permission and who have made my life possible in terms of the types of work that I wish to do, it's been a bunch of women and particularly black women. And here in the UK around this um, project, uh, we don't need permission in the creation of that book. It has been them. 
the way that I actually like to work with book clubs is I like a discussion. I, you know, I come from a uh, Southern tradition. I'm, I was born and raised in the United States. I was born in the deep South in um, Tuskegee, Alabama. If any of you have read the book, you'll know this. My father and mother both taught at Tuskegee Institute. And Tuskegee is known for many reasons, as reasons as diverse as the syphilis, the infamous syphilis trials, which is where there were a group of black men who had syphilis and were known to have syphilis and were not treated by the government. Instead, they were studied to see the impacts of syphilis over time. Um, and the idea was that they were coming and they thought that they were receiving treatment, but they were actually studying the, the what was being studied by the government was the impacts of syphilis on the human body. And of course, you know, black bodies have been used in terms of um, research and women's bodies for generations, hundreds, millions, thousands of years. Actually, Eric, I just want to cut in on that because when I was doing a capstone project for Imperial College on artificial intelligence, I reached out to you and was asking you questions and you gave me this whole knowledge that I had no awareness of whatsoever around the challenges that black people in particular have with the medical industry. And I was, I had no awareness of it at all. And I think what that's another gift that you've given us with the book is this raising of our awareness that we just, we just didn't have the awareness or knowledge of at all. So I want to thank you for that. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that was extremely the fact that you took the time, first of all, to educate me uh, mm -hmm. was was super uh, helpful and impactful, and it changed the way that we presented our capstone project. But also, I think just realizing how much awareness we have yet to discover uh, <laughs> is so huge. So I'll let you carry on, but I agree with you. I think a discussion would be fantastic, and I didn't mean to interrupt there, but I think that's- Please interrupt me. Everyone interrupt me. Please raise your hand. Just interrupt me. It's fine. Uh, one of the reasons that I start with talking about Tuskegee and, you know, the range of things, so there's the syphilis trials, but then there's also the Commodores, Lionel Richie and the Commodores came out of studying together and being freshmen at Tuskegee Institute and then they all, and they went on to worldwide fame. It has a huge history. It actually was started by a, um, an enslaved black person, Booker T. Washington, who up from slavery, which is the name of his famous biography, he helped to start this with the Rockefeller with the Rockefeller family, this institute to train black people who are coming out of slavery in all sorts of trades. Uh, so I come from that kind of a tradition. Grew up in North Carolina, so in a, in a place called Greensboro, North Carolina. If any of you are interested in American civil rights, Greensboro is kind of interesting because Greensboro is the place where at a Woolworth lunch counter, Woolworth is sort of like Boots. Um, but it had lunch counters at one point where you'd get a great, uh, fantastic sandwich, a sensational hush puppy, which is a Southern dish, um, and some fantastic, uh, you know, tomato soup. But Black people would not be able to be served at the lunch counter. Black students from the, one of the historically Black colleges and universities, Tuskegee is one of them, North Carolina Anti State University is another one of them in Greensboro. Those students took time off, went to this, went to this lunch counter, sat down and started the sit-in movement which led to another piece, another tool in this radical approach to civil rights and social equity. And quite frankly, I think of we don't need permission as another step in that radical history. And the reason, and the reason, and Joy makes an interesting point when she introduced me that I seem to be writing something, which is, it's not a memoir. I was not asked by Random House to do a memoir. I was asked to write what is really a manifesto. That's what I had intended to write. Who knows how it actually turned out to you, the reader. But for me, I was trying to write that indeed we have done as women, we have done as people of color, all the right things in terms of being able to be fully enfranchised in the world. We have studied, we have worked, we have worked hard, we have appeased. We have, after appeasement doesn't work, we've collaborated. After collaboration doesn't work, we have sued, we have marched. We have demanded, we have voted. The one thing that remains at a little bit of a distance from us is the ability to determine our own fate using those tools, because each one of those tools, in order to actually be not just an action or not just a moment, but to be an actual movement with sustained approaches, really requires that we have sustained sources of dedicated capital, which can be used to fund what we think is important. What we think is important can certainly be pushed through marching. And we've seen how that actually works. When George Floyd um, is murdered in front of our eyes, we go out and we march in the streets 
things change in terms of a dialogue and a discourse. All of a sudden, microaggressions is part of what we talk about. All of a sudden, we start talking about this issue of othering. All of those things become part of the conversation. However, have you noticed that George Floyd is not on the top of the government here in the UK, the agenda here? Even in the US where you know race and um, sort of racial equity has an entire set of organizations around it really pushing that agenda. It's no, we have to think now about things like inflation. We have to think about things like um, the uh, cost of living crisis. We have to think about things like the Ukraine. We have to even think about things like the queen dying. All of those things are obviously important and have impacts upon women and people of color. The interesting thing is that if those things change and when the ch page turns again, we will still have the same problem. If you're looking at black in the UK, one in two black children will still be living in poverty. That number, which I quote in the book, actually is taken from 2018. This is before COVID. This is before in rampant inflation. This is before the cost of living crisis. That existed beforehand. And then it existed before we had the, during the time we had the greatest expansion of the economy in terms of the investment economy in a long, long time, 13 years of quarter over quarter over quarter growth. And still we have one in two black children in the UK living in poverty. If we wanna keep the focus on that, what do we do? Do we need permission to actually add, and do we have to go hat in hand to somebody else and say, black children are important to us, white children are important to us. One in five white children lives in poverty. Children, childhood poverty is something that we have to stop and we need to make sure that we focus on it. We want to talk to the press about it. We certainly want to talk to politicians about it, but we need to put money behind it. We've never had in the UK, we've never had in the US, a business that was started by a black woman or a black man that has actually been in the FTSE 100, 200, 300, or the Fortune 500. And if you think about it, that if you think about a person like Jeff Bezos, or if you think about a person like Elon Musk, those people occupy so much of our time in terms of who's being reported on, whose opinions are considered important, who gets to participate in every conversation, whether it be about economic renewal opportunities, whether it be about should we be going into space and exploration, should we be depleting natural resources and conservation, they get to participate in every conversation because they have built businesses. And it is the business which has been done in a generation. And in some cases, less than a generation, if you consider a generation somewhere between 12 and 20 years, less than a generation, they've been able to build themselves into something which is almost a non-governmental organization in terms of the influence that they've had. And we don't need permission as a manifesto about, I want to see black women, I want to see black men, I want to see white women in that conversation, because I believe at their base, they have a different sort of a consciousness and the kind of capitalism that they, that they um, promote, which is capitalism that thinks that women make sense in top level jobs, including in engineering organizations, that people of color make sense in top level jobs, including engineering organizations. That is the answer to making sure we have the funding to make sure that moments become movements and movements become change. So Eric, you, you talked about the there was a man that you talked about and i don't i don't want to mess his name up so you'll be able to tell me it's in this it's in the book where because you said that there's not a single black founder that's made it into the fortune 100 250 or 500 so two things one i believe the first female millionaire in america was black right um and then the but then there you spoke about uh a black male that built a business that never made it into the top 500, um, but he had all sorts of challenges along the way. Um, maybe you can touch on that story a little bit because he's the one who got the closest to that sort of mark. You are, so you're talking about two people and some of you might know both of these people. One is Madam C.J. Walker. Um, if you go, go watch Netflix and there's an interesting Octavia two-time, is she a two-time Academy Award winner? Maybe a it, It's an amazing series. I absolutely love it. So self-made and there's a musical version. There's some musical in there, parts in there too. So it's fascinating. Um, so Octavia Spencer is um, stars as Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was another woman whose life began enslaved as an enslaved person in the United States. She then comes out of slavery and starts um, by borrowing. Now, let's be clear, she borrowed from someone else a solution for how do, help, how do you help women to grow hair and have luxurious hair using sulfur and other sorts of chemicals. And that chemical treatment then became 
sort of very, very popular and still the basis of um, a lot of straightening. Women who are perming and or straightening their hair, white women, black women, women with curly hair, women with straight hair, you want to do something else to it. Men with straight hair, men with curly hair, you want to do something else to it, chemically processed. Hers was one of these chemical processes. In any case, it made her the first self-made um, millionaire, a black a female millionaire in the United States. That's how she's known. She's not the first um, black millionaire, self-made millionaire in the United States, but she is the first female um, millionaire uh, who's self-made in the United States. Then the other person who Joy's talking about is referred to in one of the chapters. His name is Reginald Lewis. Do any of you know Reginald Lewis? Have you heard of him? Reginald Lewis is a fascinating case study. Reginald Lewis is a guy who would be from the city. He'd be a city guy if he were here in London. He is, he went to Harvard Law School. Um, he got into Harvard Law School without even applying, which is the oddest thing in the world. How did you get into school without even applying? A very competitive school, a black man, um, but he, had, he was that impressive. He goes to Harvard Law School, afterwards determined, sort of like me and a few other people who we know, he, that practicing law just didn't necessarily make sense. And so he then goes and goes into finance and he starts deal making. He buys a very old company. He eventually accumulates enough capital. He buys an old company with some backers called McCall's. McCall's is a pattern maker. I mean, you know, Vogue patterns and all that. I mean, it's not a sexy business, right? It's a business that's making soft goods. And this would have been used after the war, you know, it goes along with liberties, you know, the idea of liberties fabrics. And then, you know, what do you do with liberties fabric? You make drapes, you make curtains, you make, you make um, pillows, you make outfits for the family. In any case, this is McCall. So McCall's had been around for, you know, a hundred years and was going nowhere fast. He bought this and then he's able to turn it around and he's able to go into greeting cards and other sorts of things to extend that brand, which is a household brand but then extend it um, to um, something which is a little bit more interesting and especially expands to China. And in China where, uh, you know, they're a little bit behind in terms of what roles women are having in the workforce. And so people are still making things at home. So it becomes very popular in China, raises the valuation, he sells it. So he invests $1 million and he sells it for like 90 million. And so that's a huge, and he sells it within a number of years. It's not like within 10 years, it's like within three years. So he has got a fantastic, I think he sells it to Smark. He has got this fantastic track record. And many people think because he is a, a person of color that that's all he's going to do. You have one big deal and that's all you're gonna do. But we know that people who are deal makers, they just do more deals. And so where other people were sort of saying, oh, congratulations, now you retire, he decided to spend his time getting the next deal. And that next deal was a company called Beatrice International. All of us know Beatrice because of the foods that they make. Beatrice was in 64 countries and made everything from potato chips or crisps here in the UK, all the way through to ice cream. They had, they had companies in Italy, they had companies in the UK, they had companies in the United States. After this company um, had been in business for decades and decades and was actually not doing well financially, but had, was making on an annual basis about $2 billion. It wasn't as if it was a small company. He took nine, he was able to buy that company because they needed cash for $985 million. He was able to restructure. He sold off some of the units. He sold off almost immediately about $400 million worth of, um, of the company, sold it to various people. And then mainly, I think the European side of things, he kept the US side. He was able to build this back and he was able to then eventually sell this organization again. At the time that he sold it, the company was ranked number like 500, somewhere between 512 and 517. So he was right there at the cusp of having a Fortune 500 company. He sold the company uh, and then um, that company, I think the company actually went public. I think that's what I talk about in the book, him, him having going public. And that then also made him the first black billionaire in the United States. So that was in the 1990s that this actually happened. Tragically, he then um, he um, was diagnosed with brain cancer and died soon after. So after he had done this deal, and we, we don't know what he would have done next, but obviously he was a deal guy and could get into lots and lots of great things. He was in, on his way to um, sort of distinguish himself and really lead the way. He died, however, soon after. So that is the story and a story that many people just don't know. But in the time, at the time, he was on the cover of every magazine that was a business magazine. He was on the cover of Business Week. He was on the cover of even popular magazines like Time. Everyone knew this deal. And so that is to say in the book, 
that, you know, from Madam C.J. Walker to Reginald Lewis, there is a history of making change and making opportunity in play ways that people would find somewhat unexpected. And that you no, know, they didn't need permission to do that. They did it. And that's what we're looking for to build those sorts of businesses and even larger scale businesses. Well, and, and this is really interesting because we're now in a room full of women. And we were on a coaching call this week with uh, Claudia, who's I got a great idea for an app. And I'd love for her to take an opportunity if she can to pitch it a little bit to you. But the it's very interesting because here we're throwing around four hundred million dollars and billions. And, you know, I bought it for a million and I sold it for 90 million. And, and, and most women in this room and I could be, you know, could be wrong, but most women in this room, uh, five thousand pounds is a hell of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we're looking, when we're sitting there thinking, okay, you know, how do we, how do we build a, you know, how do we, how do we even buy a million pound business if we, you know, if we, if we haven't yet made a million or, you know, so many people in this room will not have yet made a million um, in any business form or and some of them will, but the, I think there is this gap as well between what makes like a normal conversation at that level where you're talking about hundreds of millions and billions um when when we're still sitting in conversations around thousands and um you know it was really interesting because i uh i was i was the award recipient of the ceo uh awards last year and they've, they've now renamed as corrales um but i was having a conversation as we we're out raising money again or about to raise money again with the coach there and I was telling her some of the conversations I was having with people. And uh, I've had a couple of great conversations with white men who were interested in, in investing in the company. And there were two major issues that they had. One was that I'd given too much equity away for too little too early on, so there wasn't enough to play with. Mm -hmm. um, and the second was that, um, you know, that there was debt in the company, uh, which was accumulated because there wasn't access to capital. Mm -hmm. So you have this situation as well where, Women uh, are starting at a different level of um, uh, engagement with the financial numbers anyway. But then when they are invest when they are bringing, raising investment, they're not raising enough. I mean, I'm, a, I'm someone who didn't do that myself. I didn't raise enough. They're giving too much equity away. They're uh, taking debt instead of uh, taking additional equity because it's not available to them. And then when they're going back out to raise, people are saying, you know what, you've got too much debt. Let's just scrap the company and start it again. And you're sort of thinking, well, that's not even ethical. So, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I feel like there's a conversation at the top of the mountain and then there's a conversation down in the valley. How do we get from the valley to the mountain? What are the steps that we take? Uh, and, and also, what are the kinds of businesses that we as women and we as women from ethnical backgrounds, you can see we've got a few amazing women here from all sorts of backgrounds. How do we... How do we, what, what kind of businesses should we be starting? What kind of money should we be raising? What kind of problems should should we be solving? Um, and how do we get to the top of the mountain versus being down in the valley? So that's a very good question. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna say three things. First of all, I, I do wanna know what kind of businesses you, people feel as though they should be starting. Let me tell you the kinds of businesses that I hear. I hear hundreds of business pitches a month. That is because Impact X, we have thousands of companies that are in our pipeline. So I hear hundreds of them. When I hear people pitching to me ideas, I find that people, and this is also in the book, that I find that people are pitching me lifestyle businesses. And when I say lifestyle businesses, the aspirational level for the person who is sitting in front of me that they are pitching is they are pitching a business which for them feels attainable for an investor feels small. So one thing that I always face with women and people of color, including myself, is the level of, what is the level of aspiration we have in these sorts of businesses? Are we trying to replace income? And that's one kind of business. And quite frankly, that's perfectly fine. But again, but if that's what you're attempting to do, then that is not a business that gets third party investment. It's just not. Because when you are a person who's an investor like me, 
who has people who've given me money to invest on their behalf, they're expecting 10 times what they put into me within three years. If you can't show me a plan that does that, if that's not your aspiration, there's no point in coming to see me, right? So your aspiration has got to be, your goal has got to be, your plan has got to be that I can return multiples of what is given to me in a short period of time, which means therefore I cannot build lifestyle firms. I can't build firms that are things that um, replace, you know, I can do all sorts, I can replace all sorts of activities and disrupt the activities which are currently being seen and I can see inefficiencies, but then I've got to plan them such that they are going to be large scale. I've got to plan them so that they, and when large scale means that I not only build them so that they can scale through me, but that they can actually be almost infinitely scalable, meaning that it's likely there's gonna be technology involved. If there's no technology involved, it's gonna be really hard. That it's going to have a real plan around what we're going to do in terms of getting customers inexpensively. I've gotta have perfected all of that in my pitch before I can get third parties to say, then that's what I wanna do. Now, but let's, let's, let's escape all that. Take all that out of the equation. If you are, you all know the company Motown, correct? Motown started with a $500 loan from friends and family. That's it. It did not start with, you know, it got to the point of being and selling for hundreds of millions, but it didn't start there. It started with a very small amount from friends and family. And so therefore, if that's the people who are going to give you money and, and who, the people who give me money when I first start an idea are always the people who are closest to me. They're the ones who are going to give me the benefit of the doubt. But what I have to say to them is I have got to present to them an idea which is bigger than myself. In, in the book, I actually talk about Thames versus Amazon, that a person like Jeff Bezos names his company Amazon as opposed to Thames or Danube or Mississippi because he has a global view. He wants to be the biggest, right? He wants to be the best. He starts off with that unapologetically. That's where he starts. Google isn't named equation, it's sort of, you know, one to what, to 100th power, um, because, you know, it's, they, they are intending it to be very large and very, um, and, and very um, scalable. Those are some things which I, which I find that we, we don't invest in very early stage companies at ImpactX. We wait until a person has a product, they have a market, they've shown us that there's, that people are interested in the product, and then they have revenue. So we don't invest in ideas. You can't come to me and say, oh, I have a great idea. Give me your money in order to put in my idea. What I want to see is that you put your money in, your friends and family put their money in. You have been able to get a few customers. Then it's something that I can say, it's, I'm going to put someone else's money in, not just my own, but someone else's money in. So I spend a bit of time on that. I really don't believe, in my opinion, there's also a little bit of what Ursula Burns says in her book, where you are is not who you are, right? Ursula Burns starts off growing up in the projects. Um, she grew up with her mom and, and her um, two um, sibling, and she becomes the CEO and chair of um, Xerox. You know, it's not something that was preordained. There had never been a black woman CEO in the United States in a Fortune 500 company. There ne she had never been, she hadn't been in a family of people who'd actually gone to university. She's the first person to go to university in her family. and you know, she started without a bunch of savings, without a bunch of anything else, and then is able to build a career from that. In my opinion, one of the things that separates the, the casual tourist in the business world from the successful founder is tenacity and creativity, which women have in abundance, which is why we focus on women as entrepreneurs, because there are various expectations. What I find is that when I'm investing in men of any color out of, of any stripe, out of Oxford and Cambridge who are in computer vision, there's an expectation of a very fast from here, point A to point B to point Z. With women, there is a perception that we will take us some time to do these sorts of things. There will be twists and turns and there will be whipbacks as we climb the mountain. But in fact, that I will need to be tenacious in order to get to the end result. I believe that we need to let's let's not be let's not be naive that that is you know misogyny exists racism exists and those things don't stop even once you get capital 
so that women who are the entrepreneurs that we have in our portfolio and that, with whom I invest and the ones that I've studied are the ones who don't necessarily start off getting to the point of having you know, 10 million pounds given to them for a great idea written on the back of an envelope from one of the big firms or a loan for hundreds of thousands. That's not the people who actually succeed. The ones who succeed start with a small amount, come up with business models that are actually that actually work, prove that fairly quickly in ways that are not very expensive so that what they don't do is they don't build out this entire infrastructure. So if you had sort of a makeup line, you don't build out a whole infrastructure and buy lots and lots of SKUs and put it into your, into your you know, second bedroom and then hold it there as inventory and then hope to sell it. You do things that are much cheaper that actually produce enough signal so that you know which way to go next and continue to refine until you actually have a plan that's going to work. And then from there, you can put in some sources of capital in order to be able to move that forward and prove the next point and then be able to show yourself and then your and eventually outside investors and others that it makes sense. That's what I noticed in terms of the, the companies like Pat McGrath of Pat McGrath Labs, who has a billion pound uh, from Birmingham girl who has a bi billion pound company. You know, it took her some time to get there, but she's done it in the makeup business and she's done it in a very highly competitive, you know, and many, 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 many deaths along the way, but she's been able to make it. And that's the approach that she's actually been using. She hasn't gone immediately for investment from other people. She planned another approach because some of those strategies just don't work very well for women of color. Yeah, well, that is very interesting because I think actually one of the things that we're looking at doing if we're not able to secure the investments that we want to secure is actually open up the investment to the community itself. Um, because we know we have people in our community that would love to be involved in the next phase of what happens. And, you know, so there's, there is that as well. Can I just say one thing about that? If you're going to start a business here in the UK, and you're here in the UK as opposed to someplace else in the world, I don't know where everyone's from. Yeah, everyone in the room is from in the UK. So if you're starting a business in the UK, you are eligible for EIS and SEIS funding, which is the ability to get to, to have individuals invest in you. If you haven't heard of this program, it's actually sensational. You get certified, you get pre-certified as a business and people are able to um, invest in you and they are able to get up to a 50% um, tax refund immediately. Put money in and they get 50% back immediately. Um, and, up to, and then it's between 30 and 50%. That actually encourages a lot of people to make speculation into businesses that they're not even that, that they, that they don't know that much about because there's a tax optimization opportunity, particularly here in the UK where so many people are services oriented people and those services oriented people get um, bankers and, and um, accountants and other sorts of things and they get paid uh, bonuses uh, at some point in the year and those bonuses need to be put to work for tax optimization reason. There's a bunch of money which floods into the system, especially at the angel level. But again, you've got to be ready for it in two ways. One, you have to be registered for SEIS, EIS. You've got to make yourself available to networks like Angels, like Angel School, which Andy Aim writes, which is for black um, people who are interested in being angel investors in companies. You've got to know some of these organizations. They should know, and then you should have a business plan that actually lends itself to investment, i.e. it needs to be technology driven. It can't just be anything because EIS and SEIS doesn't apply to everything. And it has got to be something which has growth potential because those are the things which are going to make for people saying that I would like to invest and returns at venture scale. That's the anticipation that will, that will incredibly state in a narrative that you can get venture scale returns from this opportunity. So the only, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Joy, but I just no. want to, there are things which actually exist which are possibilities. Yeah. And there's lots of lending programs. There's lots of everything from the Princess Trust if you're 18 to 30 years old, who helps with mentoring and other sorts of things all the way through to Founder Vine, which helps to people in any age, all sorts of places that actually- Well, and I, that EIS, SEIS uh, is amazing. And we used SEIS for the first, um, the first investments. And then now the further investments have come through EIS. And uh, those of you who know Martha Brook, the stationary company, that was a company I personally invested in and got the benefit of the EIS, SEIS stuff. So I think it makes, it does, it's really important to know these terminology, this terminology. And, and again, you know, a lot of you in here have done our social media training program. A lot of you in here have done our life coaching dream builder program. The, the thing is it's, there's a language, right? So there's a venture capital language and um, it's understanding the language is understanding the language within the environment that you're working in as well. And, uh, and getting onto those mailing lists. You all know we preach, you know, create a mailing list for your company. 
Well, there's going to, the angel investor organizations have mailing lists and you can get on them and you can get updates and you can go to networking events and you can connect with people and start to build the landscape. One of the things that Eric uh, did really, really well, and he talks about it in his book, he's always been a great networker, like a really fantastic networker. Um, and he, he, you know, that's one of the reasons he knows Barack Obama and how he worked with Barack Obama was because they knew each other through their environments. And so you never know who you're going to meet, but you put yourself into environments. And, you know, I mean, we work a lot at Tech Fixies, right, on taking off the invisibility cloak and feeling confident going into a networking experience. Even yesterday on the Mindset Monday, which was on a Tuesday, we talked about, you know, what's our signature line? What's our signature story? How do we how do we connect with people on a deeper level so that we can bring people on board to support what we're doing? So I love that. Um, I, we still have, I, I'm very thankful to Eric. He's given us a full hour. I was like, please give me an hour because I really want to talk to you with all of these amazing women. Um, now, Chen and Claudia, I know both of you have really exciting uh, business ideas. So I'd love for you to just, you know, give us your, your signature line on those. Um, but also, if you have questions, please use your digital hand to raise them so you can un unmute and ask. So Sharon, I know you've got a question. Let's start with you. And then Claudia and Chen, if you feel uh, up for it, I'd love for you to, to tell, tell Eric what you're up to and maybe get some feedback if you're open to that. I know both of you are open to coaching, so let's, um, let's get the opportunity while we've got it. So Sharon, go ahead. Hello, hi, yeah. Hi, Eric. Um, so with the, the EIS and the SEIS, the, um, you need to be a limited company to apply for those, is that correct? You, your you organizational couldn't. structure is very important. So it's, but it's, you know, statutory. So it's just laid out for you. Yes. Yeah. So it, as, an, as a sole trader or um, it's sort of a creative or an artist, you couldn't really apply but, but for those. But as a sole trader, can't you actually be a limited company? You can actually establish yourself as a limited company. Yes. That, being a mm -hmm. sole trader is not the limitation. That's the choice that people make because it's a cheaper and easier way to do things. I, you don't have to do that. So yes, you need to establish yourself with the, within the parameters of the legislation and you should do it. I don't know why I, I would do it for those. If I felt that I could actually benefit, I would certainly think about changing my structure such that I could you know, get the basic level of requirement. Yeah, most, most people, and that's one thing to bear in mind, Sharon, there is a time limit from when you start your limited company to how long the SEIS goes. So the, the one thing to take into consideration is if you're not sure if you're going to raise money and you're not sure if you're going to do SEIS and yes, wait until you're sure and then set up the limited company because you don't want to have those two years be gone and then you try and go and do it and it's too late. So there's definitely a time period from which you start the company uh, and from when you get the uh, permission to have the SEIS, EIS to when you actually have to do it. So that's just something to bear in mind. And that's, again, that's just doing your research, right? And getting your due diligence down and saying, okay, what, what's my long-term goal? I think one of the most powerful exercises I ever did very, 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 very early on was when I applied for a grant from Unlimited, the very first grant that I applied for, this was back in uh, 2015, so seven years ago. I, I, I remember that they asked, they wanted me to put together a, business plan you know with the financials for like the next three years and i had never done that before and that was such a and i and i remember thinking you know previous to that whenever i was running a business it was like well we'll just let god decide what the numbers are <laughs> you know like i didn't realize how important it was to have a plan and as soon as i had a financial plan and a financial financial model i had a i had a roadmap so i would definitely encourage anyone who's thinking okay i'm going to set up a limited company or i'm going to set up a company to actually do that exercise because you know if you don't do that exercise it makes everything so much more difficult because you don't you don't have a roadmap as to what's working and not working and in the social media space you know we we talk about putting together a visual marketing plan and then pre-scheduling and and then executing and then reporting on that it's the same thing in the business world you can literally take the visual marketing plan that you do for social media you can apply that to your business create your visual you know your visual business plan if you will and and then you have a, you have a map and you've got something to follow so getting clear on the, the vocabulary, getting clear on the structures, doing your due diligence, and then making decisions, I think is the, the important thing to do. And um, I think will be helpful. I'm very surprised when people come to me as an institutional investor, investing other people's money, they actually don't come with all of those documents. They don't, how, how can I actually, and I, I find it, and I talk to people, you are making, this is like going on a first date, and this is the first impression you're making, or meeting 
your fiance's parents. You know, it's a first impression. It's never going to go away. And if you are not prepared, and people ask me all the time, can I have a mentoring session or can we grab a cup of coffee? I'm judging that entire time, how sophisticated you are about this and can I invest? People come so early to the process, they aren't prepared and they think that it is without consequence. But let me assure you, in the back of my mind, what I'm saying to myself, I'm, and I, I, I don't wanna be harsh, is you're wasting my time and you're wasting your time. I'm not here to think with you about your idea. I'm here to decide if I'm going to invest in your idea. That's my job. It's not to sort of tell you whether it's a good idea. I'll tell you whether it's a good idea by whether I invest or not, but your speculations are not my job. So I have to sometimes tell people very specifically, come to me when you're ready, because if you're not ready, you'll never get another chance. The other piece is, and so that means having your forecast, having your performance and all that other sort of stuff, just find out where, what stage I invest in, which it's right on the website. It's not as though it's hidden, right there. Um, then the other thing which I find interesting is that many people think it's gonna be a short process. I have a friend named Tom Alube. Tom's very successful. Tom, is, he was on the board of the BBC. He is, um, in, he's the chair of the rugby league, rugby union, whichever one there is. Um, so the national team, he is um, a, a fellow at Jesus College at Oxford, as well as St. Anne's College. He's, he's, he's a big deal. He floated a company on AIM. And he's in, the, he's in the book. In fact, there's a whole story in, in the first two chapters about how he called me and that sort of set off what Impact X became. And then obviously then leads to the book. Tom will say, when I've had 200 meetings and I've gotten 200 no's, I'm just warming up. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again, 200 meetings and 200 no's, that's getting warmed up. There is not, so to be, let's be clear, there's no such thing for most people as I had 10 meetings. 10 meetings is a 20th of the number of meetings you need to be able to schedule in order to actually get a yes from one person. So those are the numbers you're talking about. It is yeah. not for the weak of heart. It is not, it's for the tenacious. That's why it's for women and people of color to be entrepreneurs because they understand that it is going to take that kind of effort. And you can compress it because you can set up 200 meetings in a month if you can do that, or it stretches out for three years because it takes you that long to get those 200 meetings. But you're going to have the 200 meetings one way or another. You cannot shortcut it. That is, I love that. And I love the benchmark. You know, what a gift to have that benchmark. I mean, we talk about that a lot in the Tech Use program for people who want their dream job. It's like, same thing if you've only had four interviews or you've only put four applications out there it's just not enough you know and, and it is to the level of the 80 to 100 at least before you start to really get going in the direct right direction if you haven't gone there yet um so chin i do you want to share your idea i know you know i know i'm putting you on the spot you feel free completely to say no but i also uh feel like this conversation might have sparked some ideas in you and as to how you might do things differently as you're in the early stages. Yeah, my um, business idea is in the, it's a little embryo. It's, it's, it's in the tiny, tiny baby stages, but um, my vision would be to start a virtual assistant business where I support business owners with their operations and administration so that they can focus on growing their business and achieving their own dreams but in addition to that I look at it almost as a one-stop shop in that at some stage I want to add on a coaching element and I'm also studying to be a counsellor and I'm very aware of the impact of mental health as well on business owners. So there's going to be a counseling element as well. How those are all going to work and marry together, I have not quite figured out, but it's... But it was also business. never going to be just you. I think you also have a vision for more people involved. Is that right? Yeah. An element of it as well is the fact that I want to definitely scale up. So it's not going to be a one-man band. So... The way I'm starting up is in a way that I want to start up in a way that will ensure that it's scalable. So with the virtual assistant space, I'm looking at bringing on associates at a very early stage. Mm -hmm. 
and delegating to them and scaling up so that they can then take on responsibilities. And I move on to the next stage and with the counselling aspect, almost running an agency. So counsellors come on board and with the coach in the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I sort of want them scalable from a very early stage. And I've also been looking at the online course stage um, space as well and membership spaces as well, because I also want to share knowledge. Um, and I'm a great fan of Amy Porterfield and what she's done, because I think I can only do so much as one person and sort of having different associates and people working for me. But I think scaling up definitely into the online space is a way of reaching so many more people. There aren't the limitations. So that's the big dream and vision. Mm -hmm. How I'm, it's going to work out, I don't know. So I've got a vague business plan, but I haven't sort of refined it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's always um, courageous for people to share their, um, their ideas. When I listen to this sort of an idea, and it's Chin or Chin. So when yeah. I listen to this idea, the thing that comes to mind is I, I go in two very, very different directions. One direction is that there is a human driven model for delivering services, whether it be a virtual assistant, whether it be mental health counseling, whether it be those things. And that has been established forever and ever, right? You have a um, set, the business model is you, you schedule people, you have an office, you do it, vir you do it online and you sort of uh, you, you do it by telephone and people pay on an hourly basis, a daily basis, an annual basis, you know, whatever it is, there are ways of that, that that has actually worked for a long period of time. Some of the disruption which has happened, and so if you were to go into that sort of model, uh, you know, hanging out your, sh your shingle, getting people to um, say that they like you and give you endorsements on LinkedIn and other sort of places is the way to get more customers and to grow and scale that business. If you're going to supersize that business and get to an investor level, the thing that you would say is virtual assistant means autom automatically you're talking about technology being the driver. How important is technology in this particular delivery system? And what we would think about is I'd love to see how you're talking about artificial intelligence, how you're talking about creating platforms that allow people to match need and time. It's almost like Uber need and time with service provider and delivery method for doing that, is there a place on which those people can meet at a very cost-effective fashion? They have been vetted on both sides so that everyone knows that they are in legitimate sort of a transaction. Their records follow through so that it might be the same person or it could be another person. However you like that to happen, their profile migrates with the user. Those sorts of things, which can then build a scalable business because from there with the technology, I can then build on top of it. The thing that would then be absent is I'm listening to you and I just don't know what your background is, Jen. I'm wondering where the technology is coming from to either support the virtual um, assistant or to support the idea that I think is the one that's more scalable and more valuable. My, and my question, and are you a technologist? Do you program, do you code? No, no I'm not into technology, um, but I kind of hear what you're saying and yeah. Yeah, it um, makes sense. Do you hear the difference? Technology do, you, do you sort of hear the difference in terms of they both yeah. are projects and processes that allow you to actually deliver service? And there are a lot of organizations that are doing with virtual assistants. Yeah. I, I have one of my companies called um, Afrocentrics. Afrocentrics, the CEO of that organization, and then the top people in the organization all have virtual assistants out of Ghana. Because in Ghana, you can hire the same assistant for you know pennies on the pound, right? Yeah. So that's that's how they do things, and so they offload that way. We've been doing it with call centers in India, in Northern Ireland, forever and ever. We do all of those sorts of things. The idea of taking a, a, a less expensive uh, source, whether it be Romania or wherever, and using that to deliver services in a more expensive jurisdiction that's that's been done before. The idea of virtual assistants have been done. And so when you come to see me, and if you want to talk to me about virtual assistants, I need to know how sophisticated you are about the overall market, what the business models are, who are the top players in that market, how did they get there, and how will you be better than them? If you want to create a lifestyle firm that doesn't really compete with those and, and seeks to be 
effective in a particular space and you've targeted what I really want to work with is I really want to work with women who are starting businesses that are growing in the UK, particularly in the Southeast, that's a different matter. But if you're saying, I want a business that is going to be the dominant business in the space of, and this is what I'm looking for, someone to say that to me, in the dominant space in the business of virtual assistants, and I can shake this up tremendously, and I have particular learned and lived experience as to how to get it done, and this is where it's not working right now, those are going to be the things that are going to make me listen longer and say, aha, I get it. And then we don't need permission. This is sort of what we talk about. Are you a, did, are you a native or are you a tourist? So if you're trying to solve problems for me as a tourist, I'm less interested. So it's like I sit in business class once a year and I think I can upend the travel market for business class travels. Like, eh, I don't get it. But if you tell me that what you have done is that you have been in the assistant business or you've been an office manager in organizations with 50,000 employees and you've had over time 20,000 assistants who work for you and what has worked and what hasn't, then I listen very, very closely because you are then a native as opposed to a tourist. I, I love that. And I, and I think, Chen, it's so important to recognize for everyone who's here, the, the, the opportunity to listen to someone feedback like that gives you the chance to say, oh, what would I love to do? What What is something, you know, do I want to go down this route or do I want to go down that route? And like you said, it's like there's a fork in the road and you have to choose. And whatever you choose is is your choice and your it's valid in whatever you choose to move forward with. The, the key is that you sit that you don't limit yourself. If option one sounds great, but option two sounds impossible, but it's pulling on the heartstrings, then we say, okay, how do we make option two happen if this is what is the idea that's come to come to me and it's in my heart? So just always remember that when we when we're trying to make that decision, what would I love is such a key key question there because if you would actually love this huge opportunity to disrupt an entire market, then you're going to approach it very differently than if you want to create a, a business that's got a good profit margin that ticks along that's in this one specific area and that makes a huge difference in that area, right? So I love the contrast of those two and just know it's always your choice. Okay, Claudia, this is your chance. I've, I have actually got a, a teeny, I've gone one little tiny step further, mm -hmm. is that I already had something built on my phone because I'm I'm a des I'm a designer, mm -hmm. and I've worked in the area that my apps are in. I've worked in healthcare, and I've worked in fashion. Mm -hmm. And it's basically I've I've got I've got the plan. I've, we've done the mop up already. We've done how 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 much money we need to to start and get the programming and everything. I've got we've got the model customers. Um, so Claudia, what does your app do? Tell them what your app does. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Because he, he was saying about all these things that we didn't have, and I'm going, yeah, this is this is what I've got. Let me get the picture up. Um, basically, my 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 app is it's it's a mock app. If you can see there, it's my outfit creator. What you do is, if you're struggling to find your clothes, your style, you if you want to go out and add things to it, is your clothes are here on your phone and you can sort out what you want, when you want it, how to wear it. And if you want, there's, there will be a premium version that will suggest more style options for you. And basically it's, if you've ever seen Share, Share if you've ever seen Clueless, it's Share's wardrobe. It's literally that simple, is that you will swipe through and find your outfit and you will be able to build your wardrobe it's like this. I don't know if you can see here. Mm -hmm. um, this Stick is how up. I managed. Yep. This is how I managed to get Agwudo because I had it already on my phone. I keep. Great. So this is. So you built this, and you have the ability to select wardrobe, and the and the end result is you're trying to cycle through your clothes more effectively, decide what yeah, you can it's, take to vintage or yeah, what. You space, vintage yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically, you can you can pick. Oh, I've got this green top. Yep. So I've got this one and I can cycle through and I go, oh, I need a skirt to go with that, but I, I need it to be a pencil skirt because I'm going to an office. Yep. Oh, there's my pencil skirt. I pick the pencil skirt. I pick the top. Oh, I need a jacket now. So I scroll, I cycle up through to find yep. the jackets. I think the jackets are at the top. There's a jacket there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I'm going to go with that jacket. It matches it up. If you've ever seen Clueless, that is what it's going to do. It's right. actually click, click, click. And the, there's going to be the option that it's going to, I'm, I'm thinking that it's going to link to ASOS 
and, mm -hmm. and all these other shopping apps that you can, if you don't have the clothes available, the app will suggest where you can buy the missing element in your wardrobe. And there'll be the premium version. The premium version will be that it's like, it, it will give you style advice. That's the extra bit. The basic bit of this app is basically, if you haven't, if you can't get your product pictures, there will be like a little interface where it's like a little basic t-shirt and you can do, and you can click like you know you've got bitmoji you can click say all oh, the basic t-shirt this t-shirt has got a round neck you click round neck this t-shirt has got a long sleeve click it will do the long sleeve the color of the t-shirt you click click this will be the t-shirt color i have three yeah. quick questions so how do the clothes get in how do how does they how do they get inputted into the app right eva you can when you buy something you normally get as an email you normally get a picture of what your purchase so you can click on your on your purchase and it will input the pictures there or you can do how i described it is that you can pick from a basic and customize it and add it to your wardrobe so it's the digital wardrobe do you so, see what I mean? if you've well, got like a bit do you know bit modis yes I do. Yeah, it's like that, how you design your Bitmoji. Instead of it being the whole person, it's just the T-shirt. So oh. you, you click round neck for a round neck and then it's the sleeves. And then you put that and you add that to your digital wardrobe. So one of the things, so there, is a there are a bunch of companies. The, the thing that I always believe, it's the same thing with venture capital companies themselves. There's so many who are like me everywhere. My idea is that there are hundreds of people who are thinking the same idea that I am and that they had that they started it 10 years ago. For me, it's always that situation. I'm always paranoid that someone else has the idea. I'm never, I never believe that I'm the only person who's ever thought of things. And quite frankly, one of the things that I would be talking to you about is are there systems which currently exist? I believe in terms of shopping and yeah, in there's free. There are free. And the, 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 the I do have, I've got to find a, I've got to find a PDF. But the, PD, the PDF that we've done is done the difference. It's got the pros and cons of what I'm pitching and what I haven't. This is what I was trying to do. I'm to, not that organized, but there, there, is, there is definitely, the gap in the market is for what I'm doing is that it can match it up properly because most of the apps, they, they don't give you, they don't give you the choice to, act, to, to do it properly. They don't give you the option to um, make your own style. A lot of them, the styling is very generic. It's basically, basically my app is basically, it's like your personal shopper. It's like your mate saying, matching the clothes up for you. And there isn't an app that does that. And that's what, that's the unique selling point. So, okay. Of mine but, is. Well, let, let's, let's, let, let me, let me give you two pieces. Let me give you two more pieces of feedback. You've answered yeah. my one question. And so then it's led me down another path. When I'm thinking about something like this, I'm thinking about recommendation engines because I want to see what the end game is. I, I can't quite figure out, you know, yes, every day I wake up and I get dressed. And so the night before I choose clothes, the morning of whatever it is, I choose clothes. And I know exactly the scene. There is, there is you know, Cher who's sitting in her closet with her computer and that old interface. This the movie's 30 years old, right? Yeah, it's, just, it's 30. Wiping through things. I mean, it's, it's, so that's an idea that's 30 years ago. And since then you've had Tesla started. So there are a bunch of things that have happened in the interim. So I'm trying to figure out what is the, what is the question that it's answering? What is the market need that it's answering? And how has that actually been answered effectively up to now? Because I know that one of the things that we that I see all the time is I see organizations coming to me saying, I would like to have body types that are different, being able to try on clothes. I want, I want to be able to input my color so that I can see sort of how they will actually look with me. So there are all these avatars that exist that on them you can put clothes, new clothes. Uh, things from your wardrobe, I haven't seen that necessarily, that you can actually input and upload all your clothes, put them in and say whether or not this is great or whether this is good and sort of judging it as being matched or unmatched. And so I like the idea of, you know, getting a recommendation as to what should go together based on the circumstances, time of day, year, you know, how frequently I've worn this outfit before. If you have some of that and this recommendation, which is oriented towards sort of a personal dresser, it's as if I have my own valet who is actually- Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I think that's interesting. I, I, I'm curious about the business model for that because I think what you're talking about 
is a situation which is then going to be paid for via advertising or through someone who is going to be buying, who is going to be organizations that want to get to customers as opposed to, or maybe it's that you think that there's a model where I'm a subscriber and I just want to have this on my computer and my phone all the time and that I use it in that particular way so that I buy it. But I always have to have a business model that actually helps people to adopt and then people to continually use and for them to want to continually pay and sort of why they want to do that. So it needs to be very clear why they need to do that. Everybody, I'm sorry to say that I have- you got to go. Yeah, thank you. Time. Thank you for the extra time. We are so grateful, but let's just say thank you with all our thank hearts. You. Thank you very much for letting me have your time. And if the, and hopefully thank if you give me permission, I think there's some things that might be helpful to individuals who are trying to build big businesses. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. What a privilege it was and an honor it was to get to, to spend an hour with him. And um, I hope he inspired you as much as he inspires me. He inspires me every time I talk to him. And um, I feel lucky that I even have had the opportunities I've had. Um, and I just want you all to hopefully have opened up uh, your minds to what is possible. Even if we don't know the how, we know the how is known. And let these ideas that you might have come rather than suppress them. Because where there is a will, there is a way. And uh, there's plenty of stories in Eric's book about people who started with nothing and built empires, um, particularly from uh, what we would call disadvantaged backgrounds. So um, go get them this week. All right, everybody. And uh, I'll see you later. Bye.